Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Gold here. And I'm going to be going over the 12 game main slate we have here on Monday, August 28. We are getting down to it. Uh, nearly, uh, what, a, slightly over a month left in the season. And we got football starting soon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but we're still here. We're still playing baseball. And, um,. You know, we talked about this a little bit before. This is the time of year when everybody quits paying attention to baseball. They go into just kind of uh, autopilot mode. And if you're still sharp, there can be a lot of money still to be made. Even though, of course, slate sizes and, and prize pools, whatever, uh, decrease a little bit, your edge goes up. If you're still paying attention and still sharp. So um, that's what we're here to do. Let's do it. Uh, we've got a lot of games to go over. And some pretty obvious spots. You got Atlanta and Coors Field tonight. So uh, projections and ownership are loaded to the site, uh, as always. Um, some expensive pitchers up here that are getting a lot of ownership. I, I mean, you're going to have to kind of make some decisions. I mean, if you want to play all of Atlanta and maybe all of another team, you're not going to be able to get to these guys. It's just not going to happen. And I think that's probably the correct construction uh, fading Gosman, fading Blake Snell, fading Zach Gallen, maybe even, unfortunately, having to fade Andrew Abbott tonight in a pretty damn good spot. Um, it's just the price tags and the slate complexion that we got to deal with here. Like we, we'll we'll get to Atlanta prices when we get to them, but um, you know if you want to play them and you can make that happen, I built some constructions with Atlanta tonight. Full five-man Atlanta stacks with some expensive guys. Uh, you can make this happen. You just, unfortunately, you can't get to any of any of these guys uh, up here in the top of the pricing spectrum on the mound. So, uh, that said, that's kind of what we got to deal with here. They get Austin Gomber, um, and there's likely to be a lot of runs scored, even though Gomber's been much better recently. Uh, his numbers are kind of inflated because he's been on the road. So, um his home numbers, I mean, this is Atlanta at Coors Field. So, let's just get into it, and we will get there when we get there. Um, let's start up at the top. White Sox, Baltimore. You're going to see a lot of ownership come to Grayson Rod Rodriguez here. Probably pretty warranted. Michael Kopech on the other side for the Sox. Uh, not warranted to see even 2.5% ownership for me. He has been so atrocious recently. Um, the, like, the walks are just totally out of control, so to speak. 15% uh, walk rate. It's a token four walks every damn outing. 14% barrel rate. Yeah, you had one outing at Coors Field, but, like, I mean, whatever. It, it It's everywhere he's doing this. Um, so this is a total non-starter. Like, he should be down there with Wainwright. Uh, the 6,300, um, like, I don't know where the price tag's coming from. Like, maybe it's some strikeouts to lefties or whatever, but, like, every single metric... Um, you know, from a batted ball perspective, when combined with this 15% walk rate and 54% strike one rate, uh, like, you just cannot do this, man. So I'm leaving this off. I'll just go elsewhere if I need to get this cheap. Uh, plenty of other guys, notably a, a guy making a second start in San Francisco tonight. Second start in the big leagues, at least. Um, there it, it, We have uh, Kyle Muller, right, coming up. He gets a difficult matchup. He's got some bad numbers, but he's 5,300, right? So Kopech is just totally out of play for me. I hate walks. Um, eventually, I mean, eventually, he's going to pop for something. He's going to get to walk rate under control. And he has the velocity and secondaries that can play when he can throw strikes. It's just that he can't find the freaking plate. So, um, you know, Griffall over here said that they're not going to consider moving him to the bullpen. He's just a starter, which is fine. I mean, the... the Teams what, um, 27 games under 500. So it's not like they're trying to win baseball games over here. They're just going to eat innings with Kopech. Yeah, that's great. But uh, from a DFS perspective, he is too expensive. He should be 4,300 um, to be stomaching this kind, this type of strike one rate and walk rate variance combined with the barrel rate. It's just atrocious. So. That makes Baltimore pretty viable. Absolutely. You can always stack against Kopech because he can't throw it any, anywhere near anybody um, in a batter's box. So, unfortunately, they're just like 5th, 6th, 8th down the list or something because you got some other teams that are uh, slightly better priced. Uh, and in 
some pretty damn good matchups, right? Notably the Braves and the Padres, for example. Um, but I've got no problems playing Baltimore here tonight. It's 75 degrees at um, at Camden Yards tonight. Uh, a little bit of a pitcher's ballpark. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to stack against Kopech. Uh, not because he doesn't put people on base for free. It's because he gets so many fly balls, right, that... It naturally, when we were stacking heavily against fly ball pitchers, you know, you've got to burn yourself a little bit, and you can go overboard sometimes. They can be difficult to stack against with a very heavy fly ball profile. Um, the problem with Kopech, of course, you know, is, is the barrel rate and the walk rate. It's just that it makes it um, much more viable to full stack against him when there are plenty of other base runners. He doesn't give a batting average, right? This isn't the problem here. He only 210 to the lefties, sub 240 to the righties, right? With a 235 XBA, that's a damn good number. It's just that he's putting so many people on base for free. So it can be frustrating to stack against him a little bit sometimes. You're expecting him to walk the whole country and give up all the barrels in the world. But at a pitcher's ballpark, um, this can be frustrating. So this is how Baltimore could shit the bed tonight. Kopech does have, when he throws strikes, he does have velocity still, and he does have four pitches that he can go to work with. That when he throws strikes, right, the fastball is not actually that bad if he could throw it over the plate. Same thing with the changeup. Not actually that bad in terms of value relative to the rest of the league. It's a slider that gives up all of the barrels to right-handers in particular, um, curveball, he just doesn't use it enough. So he's he's got some you know, inner workings here that could help him survive. He just has to throw it somewhere near the strike zone. Uh, so I've got no problems playing Baltimore here. They're a very contrarian stack. Nobody's going to be playing them because, well, they're, like I said, fourth, fifth, sixth down the list in terms of uh, attractiveness, I suppose. Price tags are a little uh, stiff, um, but like I said, it's going to keep their ownership down. Rutch still at 54, not my favorite here today, but uh, yeah, sure, go ahead and play him. He still walks a lot um, and still will get on base, and there's still plenty of power and contact upside against Kopech. Uh, normally, I'd be totally coming off of Rutch at, at this price because he walks so much, um, you know. but he's fine because guys down at the bottom of the lineup are likely to make contact and walk as well. So it puts him in an okay uh, production spot here tonight. Gunner, of course, at 53. Love him against right-handers. Um, Got to be careful batted ball-wise, once again, because of the, so many fly balls here. Santander, and I mean, you can play every one of these dudes. They're they're all very playable. The price tags are fine outside of the you know couple of guys at the top. Mountcastle's 47, kind of stiff there. But um, no problems playing Baltimore here tonight, and they're a contrarian stack. In deeper tournament stuff, I think this is either a really good 20 max stack, for example. Um, you know, this, it's very viable to be playing Baltimore. With Grayson, you can correlate teams as well because he's going to see a lot of ownership. There's a good bit of value on him here at 7,500. The White Sox are bad, and this is really not the best batted ball matchup for them. They hit too many ground balls, um, and that's, of course, including all of the ground balls from Tim Anderson. Right at nearly what four ground balls per fly ball against righties. It's 391 this season, <laughs> over 315 plate appearances uh, for Tim Anderson in terms of ground ball to fly ball ratio. Uh, it's just atrocious. So that's maybe inflating the buck 35 ground ball to fly ball number here in aggregate. But all these other guys outside of Luis Robert uh, and maybe like a Gavin Sheets, they don't hit fly balls. They all have ground ball leans against right handed pitching. And Grayson still induces a lot of ground balls here, right? Buck 45 in aggregate. Does give up power to lefties, so we're worried about some guys that can lift it uh, a little bit. That's maybe a Yohan Moncada or Gavin Sheets, like I mentioned. But I don't want to deal with Andrew Benintendi. He has a ground ball, buck 25 ground ball to fly ball lean. And he doesn't have any power whatsoever. Now, it is an upside hard contact spot for him against Grayson, but he's also got to deal with this fantastic changeup. Um so I'm mostly off of the left-handers here outside of maybe a Gavin Sheets or Yo Moncada um, because Yo Moncada is still at 30, what, 2, 3,100 today. He's still underpriced. He's a far, far better hitter when he is healthy than 3,100. So that's fine. 
uh, and you can always play Luis Robert. You could find a White Sox stack here for leverage purposes, mixing in Benintendi, you got to get him to strike out. Robert, because he's the best hitter on the team. Uh, Eloy, because he has some okay numbers. Also, just a 22% strikeout rate against righty. Still some hard contact there. Not the best batted ball profile matchup, necessarily, because he hits ground balls too. But you could find some guys with a Sheets, Yoan Moncada in there as well. It's reasonable from a leverage standpoint, but not necessarily from a uh, probabilistic standpoint. So I'm just going to side with Grayson for the most part here. I am concerned a little bit with the ownership. Um, you don't have to play this today, even if you do get to some very popular constructions. Otherwise, you don't have to land on Grayson. There are plenty of other pitchers that you could just take shots on if you're full stacking Atlanta or whatever. You don't have to eat this. Um, so that would be what could bring you in under this 33 35% ownership and higher stake stuff. He'll be well north of this, probably pushing 40. Um, so you, you don't have to do this, especially if you are chalky elsewhere. So that's fine, but I've got no problems playing him in this particular matchup. I do really like the swing and miss. I love the changeup. Uh, it's just the power concerns, despite the good change. Like, all of that's coming from the four-seamer and cutter that he's really not getting value out of just yet. All right, same thing with the curveball. So there's swing and miss there, uh, but there is some susceptibility, and you could find a short White Sox stack or even just a one-off here or there as a leverage piece. So uh, no Kopech, good bit of Grayson, not sure how much, um, and plenty of Baltimore, maybe a piece here or there from the White Sox. All right, let's move on since we got so many games. JoJo Gray on the mound for the Nats in Toronto against Gosman. JoJo at 7,700. I'm really worried about this particular matchup here. He's got 18% strikeouts in the tank against right-handers. Um, now, what normally keeps him in the in play, right, is the soft contact. He induces a lot of it here. And I say a lot. It's only 21%, 22%. But relative to a lot of other starting pitchers, this is a huge figure. Anything over 20% soft contact to either side of the plate is fantastic. And he's got it to both sides, right? Combine that with the just 31% or 30% aggregate hard contact rate to both sides of the plate. That really keeps him in play a lot of the time. However, with JoJo, it's just a swing, the lack of swing and miss. He's totally sacrificed it. We've talked about it all season with JoJo in order to get the power problems under control. And he's definitely done that, right? The barrel rate's under 9%. It was pushing 12 and 13 or whatever last year. And the isolated slugging here at a 175 X ISO. It's still there a little bit because of the lack of pure swing and miss, but it's a hell of a lot better than the two fifties in two say like he had a 300 ISO or something um, close to it against lefties last year. He was just absolutely terrible. He brought in the cutter. He brought in the sinker and those help him induce the soft contact, minimize the hard contact and bring down the power. Um, so in this particular matchup, could he do that? maybe he could survive, but I'm really worried about pure upside because Toronto's still very sticky, right? 22% aggregate K rate. And against right-handers, you know, there's not a lot of guys that make uh, a good bit of soft contact or enough soft contact that would really make us super confident that JoJo could excel in this matchup necessarily, right? Um, we're talking 15% for Vladdy, uh, soft contact rate, Um 12% for Brandon Belt, Witt, 16% soft contact rate, George Springer, 15%, uh, etc. on down the list. Now, the batted ball matchup for Toronto from the right side, right, doesn't really favor them necessarily. All these guys still hit a good few ground balls, like Vladdy, like Springer, etc., etc. They probably will be without Bo Bichette tonight. He was removed. Matt Chapman also removed. He's one of their a few fly ball hitters that could match up batted ball wise pretty well. Um, he would be my favorite. I don't even want to deal with Danny Jansen here tonight necessarily. Uh, and that's mostly because of the very high soft contact rate. He makes 20% soft contact against righties, you know, so um, it would be Matt Chapman. If he's in there, he'd be my favorite. You can stack Toronto against pretty much every righty. That's not going to throw it past them pretty much always, right? And Vladdy at 51 is kind of attractive. Wit here is attractive, even though he doesn't really have a lot of power. Um, very low strikeout rate, and he'll make some hard contact still. So you could find a couple Toronto pieces, but I'm mostly just going to stay off of them. They're well down the list for me, and I don't want to deal with them 
usually because they're only a 104 WRC plus offense against right-handed pitching anyway. And I do kind of respect JoJo a little bit, uh, not for DFS upside necessarily at this price tag, but um, it could take me off of uh, a good bit of Toronto, and I think it's going to just because I want to play some other offenses. Um, and I respect JoJo. It, you know, he's not a bad arm necessarily. does have some susceptibility and walks to left-handers still and a little bit of power, but uh, that's really not necessarily Toronto's strength. Uh, Kevin Gosman going for them. He's 11-2, and like I mentioned at the outset, it's going to be very difficult for me to uh, get a hell of a lot of exposure to him tonight because he's so expensive. This is a difficult matchup, too. You know, you could find a, a Washington stack here or there. I don't want to go too deeply into the batted ball matchups. Um, you know, player by player, we'll be here for six hours. But C.J. Abrams, you got excellent numbers against right-handers this year. He'd be the one, maybe a Cabert Ruiz. Power is starting to show up a little bit for Cabert finally. But at 4,900, I don't want to go out of my way to be playing C.J. Abrams against Kevin Gosman necessarily. He would be really the one um, outside of, like, Cabert. But it's going to be hard construction-wise to be stacking, you know, even in, in three-man stacks or whatever with Washington because uh, Davey over here is likely to put Lane Thomas and Joey Meneses right there in the two and a three hole. And Kevin Gosman is elite against right-handers. So I don't want anybody from the right side, too much swing and miss, very little production. It's only left-handers because Go Gosman does give up a 170 ISO there uh, with some fly balls and 40% hard contact. Still attackable there, still gives up barrels. And this is a fine suppression matchup because Washington, not all that impressive in offense either, right? So there's a piece here or there if you want to just get some pure tournament leverage off of Gosman. Um, I find it difficult to believe this ownership is going to be this high because you're going to have to, like, stat Pittsburgh and the Twins and, and things like that. Now, you're not going to be able to do this with Atlanta uh, or San Diego um, or Texas, for example. So I find it a little difficult to believe it'll be this high but that's what the number says right now in aggregate, and the aggregates are generally pretty damn accurate. So um, what that means for playing some Washington, I think my favorite price adjusted has got to be Cabert Ruiz here. Uh, I don't want to deal with anybody else. Even Dom Smith, 2,800. doesn't strike out a lot, but there's not a hell of a lot of power, uh, and I still don't want to go after Kevin Gosman deliberately. Um, price agnostic at CJ Abrams from a numbers perspective, but that's really it. Do I want to play Kevin Gosman? Uh, kind of a little bit. I think he's got seven innings and, and even eight, 10 K's in this, in this matchup, uh, and no production allowed for sure. He's got plenty of upside to blow through anybody in play in baseball, but still a difficult matchup at 11, two and plenty of other offenses that I want to play that are going to prevent me from getting to him. So it's going to be hard for me to get super excited about him. Um, so that's kind of how I want to approach this game. Maybe a leverage piece here or there from the Nats. Some Gosman where I can get it, but uh, it's probably pretty unlikely that I'm going to get to too much in this game. Okay, let's move on. Texas and the Mets. Um, here at City Field, about 70, 75 degrees tonight. I hate stacking in this ballpark uh, when it's in this kind of weather. It's just really hard to produce offense in general when it's 80, 95 degrees here. Um, you know, we drop that 10, 20 degrees or whatever, it makes it even more difficult. It's just a big ballpark. However, Tyler McGill is terrible. He's got horrible numbers. And from a pure batting average perspective, I want to stack a lot of Texas. Do I want to stack some of the Mets against John Gray? Well, maybe. John is at 8,100 today. I think he's too expensive for this particular matchup. Now, I really love the stuff against right-handers, of course. 250 batting average, 287 woven, 089 ISO. These are elite figures. Just not a lot of pure swing and miss, but he induces buck 40 ground balls per fly ball, minimizes the hard contact, did pop the soft contact to about 18% in aggregate this season. That's really the slider going to work. A little bit of the curveball, too, keeping him down. Where John Gray gets bad is his four-seamer. When he floats this, his change-up value, while excellent, tends to follow pretty closely with his four-seamer value. And when his four-seamer is bad, change-up very quickly gets bad, too. Um, so all of a sudden, John Gray's working with just a slider uh, and a little bit of this curveball here. Um, and we mentioned it ad nauseum with John Gray. When he gets bad, he gets really, really bad. He can't find the strike zone. He throws... You know, 56-foot sliders, 
and starts hanging change-ups and things like that, and he just gets bludgeoned. So you can always stack against John Gray, especially when he's expensive. Um, but do I want to do that with a pretty low upside offense? I mean, not particularly. I, I, if I'm doing it, it's with some left-handers here, like a Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor. I really hate playing Jeff McNeil anymore. There's just no upside. Hit a, he's got like a 110 ISO or something this season against right-handers. Um, the you know it's really frustrating that Show Walter keeps him in the three hole because well he's there because he doesn't strike out. He makes a lot of contact, but there's just no upside. He kills the production upside for the rest of the lineup. Pete Alonso is actually a pretty damn good batted ball matchup here uh, against John Gray, even though. You know, Gray's excellent against right-handers. Um, Petey still hits a lot of fly balls. He's not going to hit for average here because he's only hitting about 210, 220 against righties this year. But still has all the power in the world and can lift it. He's fine in stacks. I think if I probably prefer Danny Vogelbach here uh, if I've got to choose between the two, but I have no problem playing either of them. I play Vogelbach because he's 3,000, not 5,300, and he's lefty little more attackability here for left-handers against John Gray. So I think you could find a Met stack very, very sneaky. It's well, well down the board, of course, as it is always with the Mets. They're just a bad offense. Um, but you could find something here against John Gray with like a Nimmo, Lindor, Pete Alonzo, Danny Vogelbach, and a Jeff McNeil, just a one through five, something like that. Um, mix in a Pete Alonzo uh, or a DJ Stewart. I think this is a fine play as well and even a Frankie Alvarez. All of these guys are in play. They're certainly not favorites, but you could find something against John Gray. Um, I don't really want to play him at this price tag because I think the swing and miss is pretty purely limited, and these guys are going to make contact still uh, against him. So I think his his upside is kind of capped. Uh, Tyler McGill, 5,800, absolutely not against Texas. I want to play Texas if I can, but, like, geez, they're super expensive. And if you're paying these price tags, like, it's going to be really hard to avoid the Padres and avoid the Braves here. That makes Texas a fantastic tournament stack here tonight. Corey Seager is up to 6,700. Like, finally, he should have been priced here three months ago. Guy's got a 1050 OPS this year. I mean, it's just out of control. He's hitting 340. Um with power, he's been fantastic. Marcus Semyon is back up above 6,061. You can get to some right-handers here, too, that lift the baseball because McGill does induce buck 50 ground balls per fly ball to the right side. So Semyon, Addy Garcia are very much in play because they're fly ball hitters. Um, Mitch Garver's got to be the favorite price adjusted here at 3,700. Still really like him against ground ball pitchers that don't throw it past him, and his problem is strikeouts. So Mitch Garver, certainly the favorite price adjusted in this game. Um, fundamentally, it's always Corey Seager. So I love getting to the top five if I can make it happen and forcing in some Texas stacks here tonight. Um, despite a poor ballpark, I think is pretty much warranted whenever you can get them in a really good contact spot. Against Tyler McGill, 79% contact here, right? 55% strike one, 11% walks, 10.5% barrels. Like we, these are this is like the perfect storm here, the holy trinity of, um, you know, like stack targets, right? Low swing and miss, nine percent swinging strike rate, twenty four percent CSW walks, barrels, hard contact is lacking maybe slightly, um, but these guys could lift the baseball from Texas, so I think they're a very intriguing stack here tonight. Would not be surprised if they blow apart Tyler McGill. He uh, just has not displayed that he could throw it past anybody despite having 95 plus in the tank in velocity. So um, I'm interested in a little bit of offense here and no pitching for me. And that's kind of how I want to approach it. Really intriguing tournament game, I think. Okay, let's move on to Houston and Boston. Christian Javier, there's just no chance I play him at this price tag in Fenway tonight against Boston. He just doesn't, he's got 60% Ks against the left side of the plate. They don't strike out as it is Boston. And Javier gives up a 200 ISO to him as well. So um, now what can keep Javier in play, similar to Michael Kopech, is the heavy, heavy fly ball rate. It's it's hard contact that we really need when we get this many fly balls, and they're there against the right side, not so much against the left side. So I'm a little worried that Boston could disappoint here. They're a very intriguing stack as well, um, popping up there with, like, Baltimore. I think they're right in line. Um probabilistically and, and price tag wise. So I've got no problem playing some ground ball type of leans from the left side here. Like a Yoshida uh, Devers is about neutral, give or take. Um, I have to keep an eye on him. He got hit in the wrist over the weekend and he 
was scratched yesterday, so uh, they may give him another day. Who knows? But he's 5,600, very playable price tag always for Devers. And Verdugo at 4,500 is a playable piece up at the top of the lineup as well with a low strikeout rate too. So from the left side, I've got no problem playing Tristan Casas, right? He's been fantastic recently, still at 4,400 and very playable there. Um Trevor Story's an interesting piece here. He still makes hard contact. Swing and miss, he's dealing with a little bit back at this level this year since he was out for you know, five months. Um, but hard contact is a serious concern for Christian Javier here against the right side. 40% with 035 ground ball to fly ball. I mean, it's just incredibly... I mean, these could be the most lopsided numbers for a starting pitcher in baseball. Like, an 035 ground ball to fly ball uh, with over you know 60 innings this season alone this has always been his profile but uh like this is kind of exaggerated this year does still have a lot of swing and miss against righty so i want to be careful with a trevor story in particular probably prefer maybe price adjusted to play pablo reyes if he's in there tonight at 33 think that's an intriguing play um and justin turner i'm not super thrilled about at 4900 but he didn't strike out at a whole hell of a lot he does hit a lot of fly balls but he makes it plenty of hard contact so um not my favorite going after boston here tonight i think they're i'd prefer baltimore definitely um but i think they're very much in play price tag wise and uh and batted ball wise here javier gives up a lot of power to the left side and well a lot of power to the right side too and so many fly balls you can always play fly or stack against uh fly ball pitchers in fenway it is 70 degrees though and this ballpark um, similar to, you know, like a city field or something, or like a, a Bush stadium, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, plays absolutely huge when the weather is a little bit cooler. So, um, kind of difficult to get super excited about Boston here tonight, but very much in play in deeper tournament stuff. Chris Sale on the other side, 9,500 for him. I can't play this either, uh, against Houston. There's just 18% strikeouts for the Astros against lefties this year with a 126 WRC plus, I, like you just can't do it. 198 ISO. Um, this is super intriguing. They hit uh, for a 280 batting average as a team, 352 Woba. Like these are some of the best numbers in baseball and I can't do it with Chris sale, even though I'm really attracted to a lot of the, the plate discipline stuff here. 30% K rate this year, nearly 65% strike one super efficient there. 34% chase rate, super efficient there. The walk rate is under control, as it really always has been historically for Chris Sale. This is the old Chris Sale from a plate discipline perspective. Um, from a run suppression perspective, he got beat up a few times when he first came back. 470 ERA, expected pointing about a run lower, super low strand rate. So I think we're looking for some positive regression for Sale as he gets more innings under his belt. He's only got the 73 this season. Um I love the swing and miss, but not in this matchup and not at this particular price tag. So I'm going to be leaving him off. It makes him an intriguing tournament play uh, because guys with this type of swing and miss can always pick through even the best lineups in baseball. But this is a very, very hard spot. And he does still give up a 175 ISO to the righties despite very low batting average here. Uh, we don't really want to you know, take any um, notice of these numbers against lefties. They're just kind of whatever in a 43 hitter sample, right? 62 and two thirds against righties though with a 175 ISO. You got to kind of take notice of this fly balls. So we got to be careful here. Once again, similar to Christian Javier on the other side, fly ball pitchers in Fenway is always a concern, especially left-handers, um, you know, because they got the monster out there that turns into a lot of well homers and doubles too. So uh, not my favorite playing Chris sale here tonight. If you were 8,500, I think this would be a really intriguing tournament play to be quite honest, but Still pretty difficult to stomach going after Houston here. So mostly just offense here for me tonight. Unfortunately, Houston's stupid expensive. Also makes them a very attractive stack. Uh, but I respect Chris Sale a hell of a lot more than, than Christian Javier in terms of you know just pure swing and miss and survivability and suppression. So I'm probably going to leave Houston off here tonight. Um, but you know these numbers, these aggregate numbers against left-handers, really hard to ignore. It always makes them a very intriguing tournament stack. Okay, Cleveland and Minnesota, you know, both of these teams going to pop for you tonight in, in terms of value scores, um, mostly because they're cheap. Uh, Zavin Curry going for the Guardians here, 5,700. I'm going to leave it off. Uh, I don't like the power that he gives up against right-handers. And to be honest, I've got, 
like depth concerns. I have no idea what the hell Terry's going to do. With, like, is he going to let him go two innings as he did in his last start, or is he going to let him go six uh, because the Twins are bad, right? And they strike out a crap load. So it, it's really hard to peg for me. At a 5,700, I'd rather play, you know, just take shots, close my eyes with Kyle Muller uh, or something like that, for example. We'll get to him in a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to, you know, leave Curry off here tonight. Like, he's a soft toss and righty without uh, really impressive whiff stuff. Just a, you know, sub 10% swinging strike right here, 25% CSW. You know, plate discipline otherwise for a guy that only ha- that has, you know, poor swing and miss. Uh, it is fine, right? Doesn't walk a lot of people. Barrel rate's fine at sub 9%. And the strike one rate's fine at 61%. It's hard contact that I'm concerned with and pure contact rate because he's not throwing a pass to anybody. Too many fly balls here with this contact profile to get all that excited um, about playing Curry here tonight. So I'm going to leave him off. And I want to get to some of the twins, unfortunately. I love Eddie Julian here tonight. He gets a lot of ground balls and a lot of hard contact against right-handers. So good spot. Uh, Bad a ball wise for him against Curry. Um, Georgie Polanco, perhaps not so much in terms of the hard contact. He's 4,500. I might prefer if I'm playing both um, Eddie and a uh, third base piece, probably prefer to pivot it to Royce Lewis from the right side, maybe. Um, I think that's fine. He's cheaper and he's right hander, and Curry's given up more production to righty. So, yeah, let's just do that. Carlos Correa is okay. His numbers against right handers, though, this season are absolutely horrific. Um, so, tough to stomach there. Not my favorite shortstop play, but he's 4,400 and does still hit for a little bit of power, about a 180, uh, 190 ISO or so against righties this season. Uh, Kepler, of course, Matt Walner, of course, all playable. You can mix in a, a Joey Gallo if you want, or even a Ryan Jeffers, Christian Vasquez in full stacks, in tournament stuff. Um, I hate stacking the Twins on full slates, but they're cheap enough to make it happen. And if you want to get to some expensive arms or expensive you know, primary or even you know, secondary stacks, the Twins here and some of these pieces, notably Max Kepler, uh, Eddie Julian, are going to make that happen for you. So fine playing some of the Twins here. Kenta Maeda going for them. 9,200, eh, all right. Um, I'm lukewarm fundamentally here on Kenta Maeda. I've, I've always loved the plate discipline, right? 29% K rate, 7% walk rate. He's super efficient. He has excellent chase, and he's really always had this. When he's healthy, um, he throws a lot of junk here, and he's super difficult to pick apart. And he can blast off for some uh, pretty serious DFS scores with this swing and miss. The issue this season has been floating the baseball a little bit with the four-seamer and the slider up in the strike zone, right? Heavy fly balls this year, 15 starts. He's been hurt quite a bit, so not a super um, accurate aggregate sample, but the sample is the sample, and he is giving up a lot of fly balls with about 35% hard contact, so that's kind of attackable. So that's why I say a couple of guys from Cleveland over here could be in play, notably Josie Ramirez, uh, you can always play him, of course. Uh, Cole Calhoun's been fantastic recently. We don't generally want to be going after Kenta Maeda with left-handers because the splitter here is still a fantastic pitch for him. Um, I do like a, a little bit of Oscar Gonzalez as a 2,300 punt outfielder. He'll likely be in the four tonight. I think this is an intriguing spot for him. Um, he's probably going to strike out a lot, but bat and ball-wise, it kind of jumped off the page at me a little bit. So I think that's intriguing. A piece here or there from Cleveland could be in play against Kenta Maeda. So that's why I'm kind of lukewarm on him. 9200 I'm not super thrilled with the price tag. I'm okay with this ownership here. I think the matchup is fine for him to survive. Um, you know, six innings, but he might get tagged for a couple of runs, and that could torch his upside because Cleveland still doesn't strike out a lot, right? Just a 19% aggregate strikeout rate, 97 WRC plus against righties this year. They still do create a little bit, and they have plenty of left-handers here. Um, you know, that can make it a little bit difficult on Maeda. So Stephen Kwan at 3,600 at the top of the lineup is in play. And so I, I've got no problem with the top four, top five stack here. Ramon Laureano maybe heating up a little bit as well. That's fine if you want to mix in a cheap Bo Naylor at 2800 Also fine as well. Uh, really off the board, kind of Cleveland stack, but they're they're in there. Um, you know, they don't, they're, they aren't thrilling. Let's uh, let's put it, you know, kindly for Cleveland. 133 ISO, 27% hard contact, and a lot of ground balls still. So not thrilling, but price tag wise, they're going to make a lot of stuff happen for you tonight. Going after a little bit of Kenta Maeda with a low strikeout team is okay. 
for them to get the baseball on a line and in the air a little bit. So I think that's fine. I, I do like some offense here. I'm mostly going to stay off of pitching. And it's really, I mean, obviously I don't like the matchup for Kenta, but it's mostly the price tag here that it kind of turns me off. Okay, let's move on to uh, San Diego and St. Louis. Uh, we could probably get through this pretty quickly. Blake Snell, uh, I just can't do this, man, uh, at this price tag in this matchup. 10-8 and 25% ownership. Number one, he's expensive, similar to Kevin Gosman. Um, and construction-wise, if I want to full stack the Padres, I'm not going to be able to make it happen unless I punt on uh, a secondary, like kind of an SB2 and my um, secondary stack. Which is, you know, a playable construction, sure, but I don't want to deal with it with Blake Snell with the 13.5% walk rate still and the bad strike one. Um, yeah, Blake Snell is starting to regress. We've talked about this in his last few starts. He's regressing back to the, the Blake Snell that he is. Strikeout stuff is still there. That's never been the problem. It's the strike one rate and the uh, walk rate, right? Uh, I guess strikes two and three as well. He just throws too many pitches, and at this price tag and this ownership, given the complexion of the slate today, I can't I can't get to this. Um, now, he does have the upside, right? You can always play Blake Snell in tournaments because he has upside. If he throws strike one, he can he can blow through any lineup in baseball, including the Cardinals. Uh, they they will strike out a little bit, right, against left-handers, and we've seen them at least you know in their last two starts. Uh, last two games, rather, against uh, a right-hander. Um, you know, Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola t- just absolutely destroyed them over the weekend. So this offense can go very cold, despite the fact that they make 38% hard contact, neutral ground balls per fly ball. They've got historically very good hitters, right, from the right side against left-handers, Goldschmidt, Arenado. Goldschmidt's only hitting for a buck fifty ISO against lefties this year, striking out a 24% clip. Right, my favorites are probably going to be Tyler O'Neill, Tommy Edmond, Wilson Contreras, uh, Arenado dealing with a little bit of a back here. He DH yesterday, so he'll probably be back in there tonight. At the very least, is DH. Um, he's historically got killer numbers against the uh, uh, left-handers, right? So that's I got no problem playing them, but do I want to go out of my way and stack against Blake Snell? Uh, probably not. I mean, they're well down the list because he still still does have a hell of a lot of swing and miss. Um, but I'm looking for negative regression still for Blake Snell. 2.75 ERA, expected pointing a buck 20 higher, 85% strand rate. Like, it, it's really because of the swing and miss. You cannot put this many people on base for free and expect over huge samples that to persist. I mean, he does have a 145 inning sample um, and an 85% strand rate, but like, he's going to walk some guys and then give up a lot of production eventually. It's coming. Do I want to do it here with the Cardinals? Probably not. They're at their normal price tag. So that's why I say Tommy Edmond, Tyler O'Neill, and Contreras are the favorites. They're just cheaper than Goldschmidt and Arenado. Um, so if you want to take some leverage pieces against Blake Snell, that'd be the three-man I'd play. Um, you could obviously mix in Arenado, uh, Goldschmidt, or even like a uh, Taylor Motters shown some power against some left-handers this year. He's dual eligible, and he's 2,000, right? So go ahead uh, if you want to get to some of the Cardinals here getting off of Blake Snell. I probably, yeah, I'll, I'll have a little bit of these guys. Not sure much, not sure how much, rather. Um, but I'm going to have very little Blake Snell here tonight. Uh, I don't like the way he's trending again, and I don't like the way the price tag is trending. Uh, same thing with the ownership. So Adam Wainwright on the other side. We can get through this pretty quick, at, at least. There's no chance I play him, and I'm stacking every single one of the Padres, including Trent Grisham. And uh, I think there's been, what, maybe three times I've said that all season. He is awful, but I'm playing him anyway. So give me all of the Padres. If it if Atlanta were not in Coors Field tonight, uh, the Padres would, would see 20 20% or... Yeah, somewhere around there, 20, 25% ownership. Easy for me to say um, against Wainwright tonight. So it's going to keep their ownership down because Atlanta, um, you know, does get Austin Gomber and Coors tonight. So, but I, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. price adjusted, I think it's got to be the Padres for me. I want to go after Wainwright. I think he's totally cooked. Um, there's no reason that he should be anywhere near the rotation. Uh, they're not going to DFA him because they're not going to let him go out like that. But uh, it, it, they're not trying to make the playoffs or anything. So, sure, they're just going to let him kind of ride off into the sunset here. Um, but, really, it's raining where he's going. So, uh, give me all of the Padres, every single one of them. I, I, 
I mean, the price tags here are perfectly fine, too. Um, you can build some pretty respectable teams, and you could even make a Blake Snell correlated team happen if you if you tried to do that. So um, I want all of the Padres. I want nothing to do with Adam Wainwright. And give me a little bit of the Cardinals. Very little Blake Snell, I think. Okay, Milwaukee and the Cubs. Wade Miley, 6,700. This is an intriguing spot. I would not be shocked here if Wade Miley just out of nowhere pops for like 22 points somehow. Um, the Cubs here are attackable with some left, some serviceable left-handers sometimes. Now, Wade Miley doesn't have any DFS upside generally, right? But the Cubs, 103 WRC plus against lefties, 24% K rate. They do swing and miss a little bit. And the hard contact kind of leaves it on the table for us, right? Everything else, about a ball-wise, is fine. You know, it's not overly impressive. It's not overly depressing. Um, so that's why I think Wade Miley could survive here a little bit. Cubs are heating up, and they're kind of in a, a division chase here now. Uh, Milwaukee's won eight straight. They're rolling into Wrigley tonight. Uh, and these are the top two t two teams in this division. So this should be a pretty good baseball game and a pretty good series. Um, I think Wade Miley could come out here and compete. If you land on some super contrarian Wade Miley, I probably wouldn't argue all that much, but like he's not going to throw a pass, guys. 15% strikeout rate against a right-hander, 36% hard contact, neutral for the most part, ground ball to fly ball. Some of these right-handers, Dansby Swanson, Seiya Suzuki in particular, I, I really like Seiya Suzuki here tonight. Um, 3,600. He's been fantastic recently. Jan Gomes, excellent against lefties this season. Dansby, really good numbers too, despite you know, some strikeout stuff. But that's not an issue here with uh, getting Wade Miley. Same thing with Nico Horner. He's expensive. Um, but all these guys are going to make some pretty decent contact. However, they can't shit the bed every once in a while. So I wouldn't be shocked if Miley pops. I'm probably not going to land on this. I'll probably just pivot it to some other guys. But it would, wouldn't be crazy to see uh, this pro median projection maybe looks a tick low, a couple ticks low. Um, that's not a huge deal, but I think there could be some value, certainly at very low ownership. If you need something like this and you land on it, it's not the worst play in the world, I don't think. Jamison Tyon, though, I think probably is the worst player in the world. Um, now, he's been better recently. The problem is the aggregate figures are still bad, right? Certainly against left-handers. Um, like the, the numbers this season, 272 average, 260 ISO, 18% K rate, 10% walk rate. I mean, all of it's bad. 36% hard, 2.2 homers per nine, and a ton of fly balls. Left-handers is, is who you want against Tyon, and you don't generally want a full stack against Tyon because he's still really, really good against the right side. He's still very efficient early, despite the fact that he doesn't have a lot of swing and miss anymore. Barrels are the main concern here with Tyon. So give me some cheap Brewers or even a Christian Yelich. I think this is a fantastic bat of ball matchup for him against Tyon tonight. 5,200, very playable price tag. Not super thrilled with Carlos Santana um, at, at 3,900 because I'd much rather play Rowdy Telez at 2,400. Can't play both of them. So give me Rowdy instead. And there's some teams here where you could uh, fade um, or you could rather stack without a first baseman, notably Atlanta, because, well, Matt Olson is 6,900 tonight. Uh, or the Pirates, because, or not the not the Pirates, uh, the Padres, because Jake Cronenworth is now in the DL with a fractured wrist. Um, so those two, two, you could mix in a very cheap Rowdy to Les, 2,400. Uh, I think he's a pretty damn good play here tonight. So Freelick, I'm okay with uh, at 4,500. Not a lot of power necessarily, but a good contact piece. Uh, to mix in. Um, don't really want to be playing William Contreras at this price tag in this matchup. So hard to get thrilled about full stacks or even short stacks, uh, lefty stacks of the Brewers. Don't really want Bryce Terang necessarily. Um, so the, the favorites here are just Rowdy and Christian Yelich, Yelich as one-off pieces for the most part. Um, not super excited about offense. I think this could be a decent pitching matchup. Could you see Tyon survive here tonight? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be super shocked um, to see him perform a little bit better too because for the most part, the Brewers, despite 73 and 57, you know, 20, or 16 games over 500, um, they still are only an 88 WRC plus offense against righties with some swing and miss in them. Below average power, below average hard contact, etc., etc. So, 
Both of these arms could be in play if you land on them at very low ownership, um, but you're not targeting upside for them necessarily. It's mostly just, hey, these offenses are attackable kind of kind of a play. Uh, but I prefer getting to some offensive pieces and and probably leaving them off. If I got to choose between the two arms, it's Miley because he's 200 cheaper. Um, yeah, but I mean. If I got to choose between who I think is just a has a better matchup, it is probably Tyon. So, um, you know, really kind of lukewarm on all of it for the most part and very minimal exposures, I think. OK, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. Yohan Oviedo is in play here at 7,300. Uh, not thrilled about the four seamer still, but the, the secondaries are, you know, OK. They allow him to survive. Problem with Oviedo is that, well, he's only got a 20 percent K rate. 27% CSW is fine because there's a lot of called strikes and some swing and miss with 11.5% swing strike rate. The problem with Oviedo is uh, walks and strike one. He elevates his pitch count two, and this is a kind of a dangerous spot to go after the Royals. Excuse me, go after the Royals because they've been far better against right-handers here in the last couple of months. Um, 84 WRC plus in aggregate, still some strikeouts. But they're hitting for a little bit more power, certainly that um, since Bobby Witt is really starting to come into his own. And they've stabilized their lineup. They're not doing all of the, the nonsense of leading off a guy every freaking, a different guy every day. They've, got, they've had Mikel Garcia up there. MJ has been a staple in the middle of the lineup all season. Uh, Michael Massey as well. They're giving all of these guys run and all of them at bats, even though they're 50 games under 500. Um Salvi's still a serviceable hitter, and Bobby Witt, as I mentioned, really coming into his own here in his, I believe, second season in the big leagues. So, difficult spot, I think, for Oviedo. Sneaky spot for the Royals. They're actually popping third, uh, excuse me, fourth, in aggregate value scores um, on the day here so far via our Sheets value score metrics. So, that puts the Royals in play. It's a really sneaky spot. Um... He's very good against right-handers, so I want to be careful with it. It's the lefties that I would mostly be attracted to here, which is MJ, because he makes a lot of hard contact, and a Michael Massey. Um, but you can always play Bobby Witt, and you can always play Salvi. I'm not super thrilled about them. They're not a favorite of mine. And I think they're popping pretty hard, mostly because of the price tags. But this is an attackable spot still, for sure. And uh, you could see some offense here pop from the Royals. I wouldn't be shocked at all. Very contrarian stack. Nobody's going to be on, on Kansas City tonight. So they're fine fillers if you want to get there. Um, but if you land on a 7,300 Oviedo, I don't think this is crazy because the Royals are still an 84 WRC plus offense against right-handers. And he can still survive a little bit if he can throw freaking strikes. So it's not my favorite. I'd rather just play Grayson. But everybody else would too. So um, getting a, what is it, 5, 6 to 1 ownership discount. Eh, that might put Oviedo in play a little bit. Grinky, no thank you, at 6,000. Um, I can't do it here against the Pirates. They make too much contact. Um, now, I do go after the Pirates sometimes, you know, with some with some guys, but Granky's not going to be one of them, mostly because he just doesn't have any swing and miss. This is like token Zach Grinky. I think this is a token Zach Grinky outing. He'll give up about three or four runs and strike out two guys, go five innings, and that'll kind of be it. Um, but I don't want to play him because there's no upside here on a 12-game slate. I'd rather just take shots on other guys. So do I want to play some Pittsburgh? Well, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you could play some of these guys. Jack Sawinski, sure, it's fine, um, with a low strikeout rate against Granke. Does still have a respectable changeup. Does still induce a little bit of swing and miss with the slider. Um, and he can he still throw in six pitches. This is still Zach Granke. He's still a very, very serviceable veteran arm. Um, he just doesn't have any you know, pure swing and miss anymore. 85% pure contact rate is a question mark. So that's kind of why I think the Pirates could be in play here a little bit. Uh, they're also popping very hard. They're actually third in aggregate value score here tonight. Um, also, mostly because they're cheap. You got 2,400 Josh Palacios hitting in the four hole, right? G1 Bay leading off at 3,000. Only expensive guys are Brian Reynolds at 5,000, Kutch at 42, and Brian Hayes at 43. Uh, outside of that, everybody is 3K or less. Um, Jack Swinsky's 36, whatever. So offense here is fine and and attackable. I don't. I think both of these pitchers could survive though, because both of these offenses are, you know, kind of pathetic to be quite honest. So um, 
I'm okay playing some pieces here or there. Not my favorites to go out of my way. I think they're going to be probably a bit popular mixed in with Atlanta and San Diego stacks. Um, if I get to like a, a Pirates secondary or a Royal secondary or something, I'd almost rather play them with like Texas or Baltimore or something like that. Um, you know, these are all playable constructions though, and the ownership on uh, on them is really the only concern for me. But uh, I mean, it's a 12-game slate. You don't have to worry about it all that much. So, uh, interesting tournament game here for sure. Okay, here's Coors Field, Atlanta and Colorado. No Bryce Elder for me. I want to play the Rockies, too, if I can. They're cheap enough. Um, and they have a $2,000 high upside hit tool catcher they just brought up yesterday named Hunter Goodman. They're really excited about this kid. Hopefully, he can bring some power to them. Uh, he is a right-hander, so not from the left side of the plate, but, um, you know, good hit tool for him. And this is a fine contact spot for some of the Rockies against Bryce Elder. 8,300, I'm not playing him at Coors Field. Now, the sinker, slider, changeup combination is the arsenal that can play at Coors Field. Um, so I would not be surprised if he sur survived for like six innings or something. And, but he's just not going to strike anybody out. And I'm still looking for a full run's worth at least of suppression regression for him. 75% strand rate. I expect this to go down... Um, the ground balls keep that in play, right? But the pure suppression, uh, he's he's overperformed quite significantly. Um, you know, for example, right here in this, you know, we can average this and get a pretty good figure, about a 232, 234 batting average, right? He's running about two percentage points hot there versus the expected batting average. Uh, same thing with the Woba. He's got about a 295 Woba here with a 318 X Woba. ISO 130 with a 140 X ISO, right? So he's running a little bit hot still based on the batted ball metrics. He's got a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball, which is fantastic. Um, but some of these neutral ground ball to fly ball guys from the Rockies and line drive hitters from the Rockies, notably Z Tovar, uh, Ryan McMahon, uh, Charlie Blackman, for example, uh, these guys can get it on the line a little bit, Nolan Jones, uh, even Elias Diaz, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. These guys are mostly neutral. Michael Tolia hits a lot of fly balls, actually. Pretty good batted ball matchup there for him. Um, this is a dangerous spot for Bryce Elder. It's an intriguing price tag, I think, just given everybody else on the slate. But I'm going to leave it off just because it's a course field. So I'd like to play the Rockies. Uh, I don't trust the kid. I think he's got a lot more negative regression coming to him. So... I want to play some of the Rockies. They're kind of an off-the-board stack in terms of ownership, but they're top five in value right now. So uh, I want to play some if I can make it happen. Charlie Blackman, really good play, as is Michael Tolle. He's been much better now that he's getting a lot more at-bats. Uh, Nolan Jones is fine there in the probably five hole, I would say, at 4,600, as is Ryan McMahon. He's kind of expensive, but he still makes a lot of hard contact, and that is a concern here for Bryce Elder, giving up 35% hard contact in aggregate. Love Z Tovar always, and Brendan Rodgers, still 3300 still underpriced for his relative upside and where he will be priced next season. So 1 through 8 is very much playable here. I'll probably just stay off of Brent Doyle outside of filler pieces in stacks. Um, you know, he hasn't quite figured it out at the major league level this year, despite getting a lot of at-bats. He's really struggling. He's in there for his defense mostly, though. So... Give me some Colorado if I can make it happen, and give me all of Atlanta, every single one of them. However, um, we need, like, a, a, a victory music here. Ronald Acuna is finally 7,000. This is the first $7,000 player uh, hitter I think we've ever had, and it's totally warranted. He should probably be, like, 7,200 at Coors Field tonight. Uh, he's probably underpriced for the particular matchup here against Austin Gomber. Gomber's still giving up... Production in spades to righties, 280 batting average, 350 Woba, 193 ISO, 15% Ks, and 39% hard contact nearly. So um, play all the right-handers. Ozzy Albies likely to be activated here tonight since they didn't activate him over the weekend. He's 57 still. Austin Riley is 63. Matt Olson, as I mentioned earlier, is 6,900. Marcel Asuna, 51. Sean Murphy, 59. And Michael Harris, 53. So, if you play Braves tonight, you have to keep this in mind. You have to play Kevin Pillar if you full stack the Braves. There is no way you can get around this if you five stack. Uh, price tag wise, it's almost impossible to make it happen um, getting, for example, the top five guys or 
you know, four of the top five and then Sean Murphy or something like that. It's nearly impossible. You're going to have to double punt on the mound and punt your secondary stack, and you're not going to be really excited about that. So you got to play Kevin Pillar, which is going to spike his ownership pretty significantly. He's 3,500. He's almost certainly going to be in the lineup. Um, and this ballpark actually plays pretty damn well to his batted ball profile historically. He sprays it a little bit. That's why the Rockies picked him up a couple of seasons ago. In any case, play all the Braves if you can make it happen. And you can. There is enough value here. There are enough cheap pitching options to make full stacks of the Braves happen. Um, but you're probably not going to be thrilled with everybody else that you stick in the lineup if you full five stack them. So keep that in mind. That is going to keep their ownership down. Uh, which means, like, do everything you can to make it happen, I think. Um, Gomber's been better recently, but his numbers are still far, far better on the road than they are at home. And this is Atlanta at Coors Field. Uh, so, we like, you just can't do this. Um, like, it, it, it's stack the Braves. It's stack every one of them. Uh, I've got no problems playing one through nine. Um, and I'm going to do everything I can to get as much as I can. This is one of the best spots of the season wouldn't be surprised if they shit the bed because of that and you're still paying very high price tags let's not you know get uh, rose colored glasses here um you know these guys are still very very expensive and you need 20 points out of every one of them in order to justify paying these prices this is still a 12 game slate this is still baseball there's still a lot of variance so keep it in mind you don't have to play atlanta there are reasons that you could fade them and, and get off of it. Um, and, and, like, I'm not going to have 100% of Atlanta tonight. But you should probably have as much exposure as you can get. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to Oakland, Seattle. Here's one of the pieces that's going to make it happen for you. Kyle Muller on the mound, 5,300. Now, he doesn't have any swing and miss. He's got big problems power-wise against both sides of the plate. In 225 hitters he's seen this season, um, you know, 209 ISO with a 44% hard contact rate and a buck 40 ground ball to fly ball. That plays into the fly ball hitters profile from Seattle, notably a Gino Suarez, who is roughly neutral. Teoscar Hernandez, neutral as well, who has been fantastic recently. He's 4,300. He is by far my favorite play in this game. Um, but I think Ty France is very playable as well at 4,000. I don't really want to get super jacked about a ton of Julio tonight. He's 6,000, number one, and he hits a lot of ground balls. But he's Julio, and he's got all the upside in the world to get on at, against his contact profile and steal bases, for example. No problems there because of the high walk rate and the high barrel rate for Kyle Muller. Do I, am I excited about playing any of him? Absolutely not. He has a 15% K rate, a 9% swinging strike rate, 53% strike one. Like, you you could full stack against him, absolutely. Unfortunately for Seattle, well, they got to contend with Atlanta, San Diego, uh, Colorado, Texas, Baltimore, uh, the Twins, for example, all these other teams here tonight for the top stack. Um but they're very much viable, and you can certainly go after Kyle Muller, but he is also 5,300, and if you land on some of this to make Atlanta teams or San Diego or whatever happen, it's not the worst play in the world price adjusted. Fundamentally, it probably is, but um, you know, 5,300, a lot of that risk is kind of priced in, and it's not totally out of the question that he could pop for 16, 18 points or something, and that could very well be all you need. If you're not super thrilled about a ton of pitching here today, at least I'm not. So um, that's kind of where we are with Kyle Muller. Seattle, I want to play them. Like I said, Teoscar is my favorite from the right side, certainly here tonight at 4,300, I believe, in the outfield. Okay, Brian Wu going for the Mariners, 7,900. Yeah, you can land on him as well. He's right in there with Grayson. Um, he's going to be very popular. Not, I mean, this is a pretty damn good spot, right? He gets Oakland. He probably should be more popular than this. He's fantastic against righties. We talked about this a few times with him. Buck 40 average, buck 70 ISO, 040 ISO, or uh, buck 70 WOBA, excuse me, and an 040 ISO. 32% strikeout rate to the right handers and a ton of ground balls. I mean, it's just elite tier against the righties. Um, unfortunately, Oakland's probably going to platoon some lefties, right? They'll have Noda, they'll have Seth Brown, they'll have Tony Kemp, they'll have Lawrence Butler in there. I don't want to stack Oakland. I would rather play Brian Wu. I think he's probably uh, underappreciated by the the markets here so far, given this projection and this value score. It should be higher. And I think he's a very viable play here tonight. Um, 
in Seattle against Oakland. It's only 75 degrees or so uh, in uh, at T-Mobile Park. So no problems playing a good bit of Seattle. You can play correlated teams. You're going to get very low ownership on the stack. And, you know, what I would consider depressed ownership on Brian, Ru- Brian Wu for the spot. Uh, however, you got to be careful because he's got terrible numbers against lefties, right? Big, big platoon split here. Ryan Noda, once again, the favorite for um, for the Athletics. want to be careful with Seth Brown, even though I love playing Seth Brown against righties to give up power. He's a very high fly ball hitter, and this is not a good batter ball matchup necessarily, but he'll be able to make some hard contact and lift it. So I think that's pretty okay for the most part. Um, Zach Geloff, I don't want to deal with at 5,600. Brent Rooker, I don't want to deal with at 4,000. Tony Kemp is fine if 3,300. He'll probably be in the five hole. So I don't want to stack these guys. It's mostly just one-offs again. Similar, again, similar to the uh, Dylan Cease play of uh, some of the Oakland pieces what, over the weekend or Friday or something. Similar outing here. Good against righties. Um, you know, a ton of strikeout stuff, at least. You know, obviously, Dylan Cease walks the whole country against righties. But um, I, I do like some Ryan Nota here. And he's probably my favorite, or maybe a Lawrence Butler, 2100 outfield, cheap piece to punt with there. So uh, give me Seattle. Got to lay 275 into betting markets. I don't know about that. But, um, you know, for DFS purposes, they're very well priced, and correlated teams are absolutely in play. Okay, since he's in San Francisco, I want to play Andrew Abbott, 9,800 here against San Francisco. I think it's a pretty damn good matchup for him, to be quite honest. Um, there's only, what, two hitters that are going to hit ground balls from the right side over here, and it's Tyro a little bit. It's mostly J.D. Davis. Um, you know, all the other right-handers that they're going to platoon against him, the Giants, are like fly ball leans and, you know, like neutral type of, uh, battle ball profile so not all that exciting um and they've got some strikeouts in them right so like wilmer flores high fly ball hitter right doesn't strike out a lot tyro he'll be, he's about neutral austin slater maybe a slight ground ball lean um you know and all these guys have good numbers right against left-handers in general and abbott is a little bit susceptible against righties right 37 percent hard 050 ground ball to fly ball that's very attackable for sure 190 iso allowed not a lot of batting average though and this game is it's gonna be 60 degrees in san francisco tonight in a huge ballpark so um they'll still swing and miss and i'm okay playing a little bit of andrew abbott if you get to him at super low ownership as a late night pitcher throwing in San Francisco. I got no problems uh, doing that pretty much ever against this team that strikes out. Um, That said, it's still super hard to get to him because of all the offenses, the expensive offenses in really good spots that you'd like to play tonight. So uh, that's going to keep my ownership down. Certainly I'll probably, I haven't run a build yet this morning, but uh, I'll probably come in somewhere around this. Um, but I kind of wanted to play him tonight. He jumped at me as a really contrarian tournament play, and I think it's perfectly fine. Kyle Harrison is going for the Giants. Um, he is making his second start, right? He uh, was on like a turbo slate or something uh, at uh, when he debuted, whatever it was, five days ago. Um, he does have – he's mostly a two-pitch guy, right? He showed a cutter. He showed a change. Uh, but he threw a lot of this four-seamer. You can't really do that. Um, so – He's got to be in play here. It's mostly the price tag, though. And the Reds against left-handed pitching are a 96 WRC plus offense, 24% K rate. Um, not all that impressive, mostly just average, right? Pretty much everywhere. So the, given the price tag, it has to put him in play because you're going to you're gonna need this in a lot of teams you build tonight, I think. Um, that's why his ownership is popping to 15% here. It's not because you know he's a super high upside prospect for them necessarily. Um, and it's not because the matchup is all that excellent, but well, it's, it's okay. And it's in San Francisco at 60 degrees and you want to play every Atlanta piece piece that you can. So that's why he's popping so hard. Uh, I, I got no problems with it. I'll probably come in roughly with the field here just for some exposure construction wise, but it's not, um, you know, we can't really take anything out of this fundamentally so far, uh, outside of, you know, strike one is great. Right in the uh, his first outing, 35% CSW is great. We need depth out of him though, uh, so that could be a concern if they want to, you know, limit his innings from this season. 
and limit his pitch count, uh, that could be in play uh, for the Giants. They pull this crap all the time. So you got to be careful when you're playing Giants pitchers, uh, whether they're true starters or long relievers or openers or or whatever the hell it is. So uh, do I want to play the Reds? Probably they're going to miss the cut for me tonight. Um, They're expensive. Noel V. Marte, if they do something crazy, like lead him off, I think that's a pretty damn good play. Go ahead. He's 2,800. you want to play like an E3, 3,400 first base? I think that's fine, too. Uh, you can always play Ellie. You can always play McLean. But these guys are very expensive. Uh, so I'm going to be careful with the Reds tonight. Um, probably just have some Kyle Harris in. Maybe a piece here or there from Cincinnati. No Giants, really, for me. Um, maybe a, you know, like a Wilbur Flores, I guess. Or a J.D. Davis. I'd really like the batted ball profile at third base there, 3,500. He's fine. Um that's pretty much it though I think I mean they're cheap enough to make filler stacks happen as like late night three mans or something with a Slater Tyro JD Davis or or whatever Um, that's an intriguing sort of construction to look at but uh, not overly thrilling for me necessarily okay last game here Arizona and the Dodgers Zach Gallon I just got to leave him off tonight man the 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 matchup is too bad the hard contact is a serious concern here I can't do this um, against the Dodgers 37% hard against the lefties and 42% hard against the righties, um, it's, it's just out of control too high. And he's been playing with fire a lot recently, and I don't want to deal with it. Not against the Dodgers. He's too expensive, I think, in this particular matchup. Um, even though I love playing Zach Gallen, man, I really, really like this arm. This is a super, super hard spot. And given the constructions that you're likely to want to land on tonight, I, it's just going to... Uh, make it really difficult for me to get any more than three to five percent of Zach Gallon. Um, he's a fantastic tournament play if you can make this happen and you land on a 10-5 pitcher somehow with a team that you like otherwise. So go ahead, no problems there. If you can make it happen, uh, you can always play Zach Gallon against everybody in baseball. But uh, this contact profile in this particular matchup is super concerning because the Dodgers, right, against right-handed pitching. Um, still 35% hard contact this season, still hit for a lot of power, still lift the baseball, and that's a concern from both sides of the plate. Lefties mostly because they got fly ball hitters over there, like a, a Max Muncy, um, you know, Freddie Freeman has the best batter ball profile in baseball. Um, and then from the right side, you got Mookie, right, and you've got like Will Smith. These guys are fly ball hitters. And they're not going to strike out. So from a contact perspective, it's a difficult spot for Gallon. Bat a ball perspective, he, he is probably favored there from ground ball to fly ball point of view. Uh, but the hard contact, man, is a big, big worry for me. So I'm not eating this price tag uh, on this slate today. There's plenty of slates where I would play 10-5 Zach Gallon at sub-5% ownership against the Dodgers. Today, I don't think is going to be one of them. So um, really kind of concerned there. If he gets tagged for two runs... I, this team's going to make it really, really difficult on him. But I wouldn't be surprised, though, if he pops. Uh, Bobby Miller at 8,800. I'm concerned a little bit about upside for him. 22% aggregate strikeout rate here. The plate discipline outside of just a pure sway and miss is fantastic for a guy that just debuted earlier this season. I need some more chase. Um, he's got to get some more swing and miss out of the slider and the curveball here. Um, but for the most part, CSW 27% is fine. He's running right in line with his expected suppression at uh, 385 ERA, give or take. Strand rate's pretty low, so if we're looking for a little bit of positive regression for him, given that he induces buck 50 ground balls per fly ball, I think it could come in the strand rate. He doesn't walk people, so anybody he does put on base via batting average, notably two right-handers at 275, he could be stranding them and regressing positively in the strand rate. So that could keep him in play here against Arizona. Difficult matchup because they don't strike out a lot. They're still going to make a good bit of contact. And they're sticky offense. Um, Even though I do respect Bobby Miller. I love the velocity. I love that he stays down in the strike zone. Doesn't give up any power here. It's just pure upside I'm questioning at 8,800. I need him to go a little bit deeper in this particular matchup. And I'm I'm kind of um, on the fence about that here tonight. And as I've mentioned before, we're getting into September and, you know, late season Dave Roberts season. So we got to be careful with the Dodgers pitching staff. Um, you know, if they get any sort of lead on Zach Gallen, Bobby Miller might not be long for this game. If they get uh, any sort of lead on 
Bobby Miller, he might not be long for this game, you know. So it, I'm questioning it a little bit. If you land on something like this, like he's not overly expensive um, to make construction or that would prevent you from uh, fitting him into constructions, I, I should say. Um, so that's fine if you land on something like this, I, I think. But uh, difficult matchup, and I still really respect Arizona's offense over here. So um, eh, I'll probably come in somewhere around this figure, 5, 8, 10% or something like that. 10% may be a little bit aggressive for me. So that's kind of how I want to approach this last game. Mostly a write-off. I respect the pitching. Um, I don't want to go after these guys necessarily. But I think if anybody, I probably have to play, I don't know, like Corbin Carroll, 56, Cattell Marte, at, or something like that. You know, But not overly thrilling to be playing offense here in this game. Okay, that's it. I think we went pretty long here tonight, but who knows. Let's quickly review. White Sox, Baltimore, no Kopech whatsoever. Good bit of Grayson and as much Baltimore as I can get um, against Kopech. You get the walk rate and the barrel rate is just way too high. You could find a White Sox stack um for leverage purposes against Grayson and contact purposes too. He's got some pretty terrible numbers. JoJo, I'm going to probably leave off. He's a really shrewd tournament play here because of the soft contact and the soft contact alone from his perspective. But Toronto doesn't make a lot of soft contact themselves against right-handers. So uh, I think he's probably going to struggle. He'll probably give a, get dinged for a couple of runs, and then he'll have a really hard time making that up. Kevin Gosman, I'm going to leave off for the most part. Um, I'd like to try and get to somewhere I can, but he's 11-2, and I want to play really expensive offenses tonight, and it's just going to totally prevent me from getting there. So um, maybe a C.J. Abrams 4,900 against Kevin Gosman. It's kind of gulpy, but uh, Kbert Ruiz, uh, okay, like whatever. Mostly a write-off for me, I guess. I want to play Texas, though, and I want to play a, maybe a little bit of the Mets against John Gray. You could find a Mets stack. Favorite, though, is definitely Texas in this game. I don't want to play John Gray. I think he's too expensive for this matchup. I'm certainly not playing Tyler McGill against Texas. So give me everybody from Texas. They're very expensive, and, but nobody's going to be playing them. They'll be sub-5% tonight um, because everybody's going to be playing everybody else. So go ahead. Makes him a really, really good tournament stack. Houston and Boston, same thing here with Houston. They have some of the best numbers in baseball against left-handed pitching. Chris Sale is overpriced for the matchup. So you could take shorts here on Houston. They're a really intriguing tournament stack. However, they're mega expensive also. Um, they, they're, they're fine in like 20 max, I think. Really intriguing there. Definitely in deeper tournament stuff. Probably not going to get there in 3 max or something like that. Uh, because Chris Sale is still pretty respectable. Really good plate discipline here for him still. Um, Boston, I think, is very intriguing as well from a contact perspective against Christian Javier. Too many fly balls, way too much hard contact, no strikeouts against the left side. So Boston and Houston offenses both in play. No pitching here for me. Cleveland and Minnesota, uh, mostly offense here for me as well. Maybe a little bit akin to Maeda. I mean, I don't know. Just kind of if you land on it, though. Mostly lukewarm in this particular matchup. think it could be a little bit sticky for him. Um, David Curry, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, I, I do like the Twins a little bit here. Um, mostly a, a, an Eddie Julian, Max Kepler, maybe a Royce Lewis, something from the right side. Okay, fine, if you want to play Carlos Correa, eh, whatever. Um, that's kind of how I want to approach that game. San Diego and St. Louis, I like offense uh, almost exclusively here, too. Not so much from the St. Louis perspective, but there's a couple guys over here playable. Tommy Edmond, Tyler O'Neill, uh, Wilson Contreras behind the plate. And give me every single one of the Padres, including the... Um, you know, absolutely horrific Trent Grisham down at the bottom of the lineup. I'm, if you guys can't tell, I'm trying to really talk myself into this because I hate playing the guy. Uh, in any case, give me all the Padres uh, against Wayne right here tonight. Milwaukee and the Cubs, a really interesting tournament game here, I think. Tyon and Wade Miley both in play as I've kind of talked through the slate here tonight. Wouldn't be surprised if either of these guys put up a serviceable outing and nobody's going to be playing them, so sure, go ahead. If, you're if you are chalky in your... Uh, um, in your stacks, then landing on either one of these guys is not horrific. I do really like Christian Yelich and Rowdy Telez against Tyon, though, uh, and I do really like Seiya Suzuki against Wade Miley. Um, you know, so it's a difficult spot for both of them, but in play, if you land on it, I'd probably just side with the offense, but really intriguing tournament game there for sure. Same thing here, Yohan Oviedo and Zach Greinke, no pitching here for me, maybe a little bit of Oviedo, um, probably very little though, especially if I get to any of Miley and, and Jamison Tyam. Uh, some offense though, they're popping really hard, mostly because these guys are cheap, but I think they're uh, very playable for sure. Um, 
you know, I, I like some pieces here from Pittsburgh getting Zach Ranky because of the contact profile and Oviedo because, well, he's not all that good, doesn't have all that but that much swing and miss, and he walks people. So, sure, play the Royals. Land in Colorado, every single one of the Braves, and give me every single one of the Rockies, too. I want to go after some Bryce Elder, even though this contact profile um, – could play for him. Certainly the pitch mix plays for him at Coors Field. I am still looking for negative regression to come, and it could come, it could hit him like a ton of bricks uh, at Coors tonight uh, against Rocky. So give me offense only here. Oakland and Seattle. Kyle Muller, sure, at 5,300, but man, the fundamentals are going to tell you to stay the hell away from this. And you don't necessarily need to get all the way down here. You can still make a Braves, a full Brave stack happen without eating 53 on Kyle Muller here. So that said, Give me some Seattle. I want to stack against him, too, if I can make it happen. Brian Wu, I really do like him as well at 7,900. Pretty good matchup for him. Some of the lefties over here are still going to strike out. Uh, favorite is Ryan Noda uh, still, and maybe a little bit of Seth Brown um, because of the really drastic split here for Brian Wu. But he's so good against righties that he could blast through this lineup. I would not be surprised if he threw, like, a complete game to here tonight. Uh, since he in San Francisco, uh, kind of a write-off game for the most part. I want to play some Abbott, but I'm probably not going to be able to make the price tag happen all that regularly. Same thing with Kyle Harrison. I'll have some of him. Uh, offensively, I guess it's mostly just a write-off. Give me some Noel V. Marte or an E3. Um, that's fine. Ellie and Matt McClain, okay. Spencer Steer, like, whatever. Maybe a, a short stack of the Giants here against Andrew Abbott and his bad numbers against righties. Arizona and the Dodgers, mostly a write-off here for me. I really respect the pitching. Maybe a little bit of Bobby Miller, uh, probably no Zach Gallen. I'm just not going to be able to make it happen. Um, for example, I'd much rather just play Andrew Abbott at 700 cheaper or whatever. So uh, that's kind of where I am. And as always, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as we will continue to push them all throughout the day. And good luck to everybody here on Monday's 12 Gamer.